So, I have a confession to make. It's uh, about a problem I have. A problem with self-control and uh, discipline. A big, black-eyed, multi-franchise-wide problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I love Funko Pops. And my problem is that I can't stop buying these little bastards even though I'm broke. Now, before you dislike this video and call Funko Pops normie trash, just hear me out. So, what makes these cheap, often error-prone collectibles so good? And why am I actively forcing myself into poverty just so I can snag the newest wave? Rest assured, I'll answer this question, but first let me preemptively say that no, this video is not sponsored. I mean, come on, do you really think Funko is gonna sponsor my no views getting ass? Nope. This video was done all because of the love I have for these little knickknacks. Now look, I'm not gonna tell you that Funkos are the best figures on the market. Hell, I can wholeheartedly admit that other figures, plushies, and androids tend to have an inherent higher quality, paint and material wise. But while Funkos have an undeniable appeal over almost any other figure on the market because of just how easy it is to find what you want and buy it for a reasonable price. You see, these little bubbies usually retail for around $12. But come on, when's the last time you saw a store that sold pops and didn't have some kind of two-for-one deal on them? At this price point, it's obscenely easy to snag a collectible from one of your favorite franchises. Or at least it's way more affordable to grab a couple of these than it is to buy most decent non-Nightmare Fuel figures. I mean, let me put it this way. I grabbed all three of these figures for around $20. That's three very different franchises with memorabilia that's way harder to find than your average collectible. I mean, Joker's decent figures alone start off in the hundreds, and Yu Yu Hakusho figures aren't really being made anymore, which means that if you want one, you're gonna have to pry it from some weeb's cold, dead hands. It's this wide selection of easy-to-find, cheap-to-buy collectibles that initially turned me on to these little figures. And if I'm being honest, the term wide selection is the understatement of the century. Quite frankly, this is because of the corporate culture of the company. It could be summed up pretty easily, but I'll let creative director Sean Wilkinson explain himself. Our slogan is kind of everyone's a fan of something, and I think our mission is to be sure that we're getting that something to everyone. Funko has landed the rights to over 1,100 different creative IPs, and those 1,000 IPs each have multiple characters represented. Sure, they've got your basic stuff, Star Wars, Marvel, Pokemon, The Simpsons, sports teams, but these niches go way deeper. Samurai Jack, Castlevania, Community, God of War, Lord of the Rings, Warhammer 40k, and so, so, so much more. The vast catalog of pops to choose from is astounding and maybe even a little intimidating. I mean, where the hell do you even start with a brand this big? Here's a pro tip. Don't start with the emojis or trolls. Look, I've seen plenty of people shit all over Funko's reputation for making pops of these abominations, but let's be real. It's not Funko's fault for taking a fat check from Sony just to make these pops. If you want someone to point your pitchforks at, then point them at the creatures who buy these things. And rather than focusing on this trash, I started my collection with these beauties, which not only cost me a fraction of the price that I spent on this one figure, but also feature characters that straight up don't have normal figures yet. And come on, where else am I going to find a collectible figure of something like The Office? It's a live-action TV show that isn't based on anything overtly cinematic or dynamic. Which means it's probably safe to say no company is making an affordable Michael Scott figure. Okay, maybe not. But even if some company is making these figures, that doesn't mean I'm going to drop $80 for a set of The Office action figures. Look, I love The Office, but where the hell am I going to put a figure of some normal-ass looking person? Next to Bakugo? Next to Red? Come on, man, that would break the aesthetic. Instead, Funkos serve as an affordable option to add that collectible element to dozens of different fandoms that would have otherwise struggled to find a profitable foothold in the collectible market. The reason Funko can make and sell pops of simple slice-of-life characters like Michael Scott or Jeff Winger is in part due to the iconic signature design of big, bubbly black eyes, short stout bodies, and big bobble-like heads. 
These design trademarks are consistent throughout every single pop, save for the notable exceptions of characters like the Demogorgon who don't have eyes. This design symmetry gives Funkos, even the ones based on average people, collectible appeal, but even more so, it makes them homogenous. I mean, yeah, obviously, with a brand this big touching so many different franchises, you're bound to get a couple characters that look similar, especially due to the lack of super fine details. But this lack of detail is actually the key to Funko's success. See, since the designs for Pops are simple, lacking the fine details often attributed to other figures, the cost to produce them goes down, which in turn means that Funko can make multiple variants of a single character, or even produce other less popular characters that might not get to see a detailed figure release anytime soon. It's one of the reasons Funko has made a Tokoyami figure before any other officially licensed company could. And even though these many different characters and shows are fundamentally different from each other in so many ways, my collection doesn't really clash with itself. I can put a Pam Halpert Funko Pop next to a Thor or a Bender, and they won't really clash like most other collectibles would because of these shared trademark designs. This homogeny allows pops from wildly different spectrums of fiction and reality to blend almost seamlessly, regardless of the genre or medium they originate from. The perfectly rectangular boxes only add to this sense of identity, as they make it exceedingly easy to stack and display your pops in ways that other collectibles simply can't be. Putting it simply, Funko Pops are ergonomic in design, making it really easy to show off one's collection which to me, being someone who lives in a smaller space yet still wants to display collectibles can attest to, is very, very important. Hell, Funko Pops even serve well as a backdrop for other collectibles, or as the perfect canvas for signatures. To me, this versatility makes Funkos a necessity to almost any memorabilia collection. I'm not too proud to admit that I'm, uh, how do I put this? Fiscally challenged. I, I mean, I'm a college student who makes YouTube videos in his free time. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that my bank account reflects these life choices. But even with the little money I have every month to spend on games or collectibles, Pops are just the most convenient and affordable way to represent my favorite franchises across the board. But I'd be lying if I said there wasn't one big reason behind my love for these things and it all lies in the oldest trick in the history of collectibles. Exclusivity. See, remember earlier when I said that one of the appeals to Funko Pops is their find and buy affordability? Well, that is mostly true. Funko is always releasing new waves of Pops, so even if you missed a wave in the past, there's a decent chance for a restock or future waves. I myself barely ever struggle to find a pop I want for a price I consider reasonable. That being said, Funko is very well known for their tendency of creating exclusive quote unquote variant or chase pops, which are only available from certain retailers at certain times of the year. Places like Target, Hot Topic, FYE, and even Barnes & Noble pay big bucks to land these elusive and sometimes insanely valuable pops. But what exactly does exclusivity mean in terms of a pop? Well, it can mean anything from subtle differences in previously published pops, like the exclusive version wearing glasses or petting a kitten, to more drastic exclusives, like an entire fan favorite character. You see, this is where being a fan of a series that gets an exclusive pop gets even more fun, because these rare variants always draw inspiration from specific moments in the shows or properties they reference. Things like Deku's battle-torn suit from one specific episode of the show, or Dwight's likeness on Jim Halpert. Funko Pops like these are delightful to fans of the franchises they come from, not only because they feature fan-favorite characters, but also because they tend to call out some pretty obscure moments from the source material, like this Saitama Pop featuring everyone's favorite bald hero for fun, wearing a removable wig. And on the other hand, when a pop isn't a specific reference to something, but is instead an entirely new character, well, they become arguably more appealing. What fan of My Hero Academia could pass on characters like Mirio or the hero killer Stain? And what self-respecting fan of Yu Yu Hakusho is going to pass on Hiei? And what, you're seriously telling me you wouldn't want a Pikachu? 
To me, as a collector, exclusivity has always been one of those primal draws. It's why I still occasionally buy a pack of Pokemon cards, even though they're essentially just the real-life equivalent to loot boxes. As far as exclusivity goes, Funko does it almost too well. In fact, even though the odds aren't very likely, some of these exclusive pops can go for some serious cash after their limited stock in stores is all bought up. Pops like the Planet Aurelia Vegeta or the Holographic Darth Maul go for upwards of $2,000. Hell, even some non-exclusive pops like Tenya Ida and Spike still go for around $100. And keep in mind, all of these cost around $12 at release. It's all of these things, the general affordability, exclusive variants, ease of access, and a vast assortment of things to pick from that make Funko Pops an easy collectible of choice for me. Until the day I'm rich enough to buy a thousand dollar Devilman statue or a functioning suit of Spartan armor, well, I'll just have to settle for these little guys. And that does not bother me in the slightest.